So you have to go to plays in the house. And we're live. And there's Julie. <laughs> this we've never had this many problems. Thank you. And we've done like 170 shows. I mean, we thought we were live. We were just broadcasting. Yeah. For, anyway, so, yeah. anyway, whatever. And we, I think yeah. we're also out of sync. Yeah, we thought we were live. Here's the we deal. weren't. This is Stars in the House. We began in March. <laughs> We've been raising money for the Actors Fund since March. The, um, Believe it or not, we're actually, we've raised, thanks to viewers of Stars in the House, I think it's like 170th show or something like that. We've raised almost $400,000. Yeah. Just even with this, this horrific, horrific tech, tech work. team. So this is all just from <laughs> donations from you guys. We don't have any big corporate sponsors, 10, 20, 50 bucks, almost $400,000. <laughs> and people want to know what the Actors Fund is for. Yes. It uh, is for, it's really a, a misnomer, which Lisa will know that word because she went to Vassar. Misnomer means, thank you, she's not. It is, it doesn't mean anything. It, it's the wrong meaning because it's not just actors. It's anybody in show business or actually really the arts. So it's people on stage, people off stage, people in front of the camera, behind the camera, caterers, uh, stage managers, ASM, makeup people, anyone can go to the Actors Fund. All over the country. Yeah, all over the country. You go to the Actors Fund, you go to actorsfund.org, you say, I can't pay my rent, I can't pay my health insurance, and they say, how much How much do you need? And you tell them, this is my rent for the month, and they will give you the cash. They will help out anybody if you're a professional in the arts. So if you have if you have any problems, and I know a lot of people are right now because no one's really working. And this is their big initiative right now, every artist insured. Because be health insurance is running out for almost everybody right now because you get it by how many weeks you work, and of course, no one's work. Right. So if you're, especially if you're having health insurance problems, go to actorsfund.org. But if you're having problems paying for your groceries, your medical bills, they really will help. So you go to actorsfund.org, and if you can actually give some money to the Actors Fund, you can donate where it says on the bottom. So you donate to starsinthehouse.com, and then, by the way, Ori, we started a new thing. We just got this. Thing All right. Actors Fund. You can text. Seth is talking faster than usual well, I get because to of so the I know. You text to 56512, <laughs> yes. that, and then you forward your donation to donations at startsinthehouse.com. And then we'll forward it to one of the actors, and they're going to read it um, out loud. They do want to see your donations. That's my tip of the hat. Tip. Well, uh, the sorry. crazy ex-girlfriend reunion that was on I friday no because it's so amazing the fans i mean they have amazing fans like the comeback has amazing yeah. fans that are just like watch the show numerous times by the way like seth and i have um and i think like the total for crazy ex-girlfriend was basically one hour like one hour like or well went long like 11 or 12 thousand 11 yeah. or twelve thousand dollars right and in fact rachel bloom was so happy um crazy ex-girlfriend is going to come back yeah. i can't tell you when but they're going to come back and it's all going to be focused on fan questions and going to have more people on it's going to be a, a lot of fun it's really great having these tv shows with amazing fans but like we're sort of the most psycho fans for the comeback we're sort of like at the level of psycho okay so before we begin right. um the comeback you know we've been every night we've had someone from black theater united this amazing new organization that so many of our friends have founded so Audrey mcdonald's um, literally here on her iPhone to talk about Black Theater United and their, and their initiative. My only problem is she's, it looks like she's filming from the middle of Mace, the cafetorium for my junior high school. <laughs> Am I right? It's basically the cafetorium. Anybody? Basically, I it was um, I was filming a concert today um, in a performing arts space, and I was hoping to get home in time to get to my own computer, but I didn't. So I just ran in here to the dressing room. So I'm literally in a dressing room somewhere in Midtown, Manhattan. Um, but yes, um, listen. So Black Theater United, we are pushing this initiative about the census. And here, every night we've been talking about why it's so important. Here's all you need to know. Today, yes. um, those of those people who are in our um, uh, federal administration, um, who are residing in the White House, have um, issued um, what they're calling an executive order to ban undocumented Im immigrants from uh, participating in the census. And that is unconstitutional. So th this is showing you just how important the census is. If, right. if people are trying to take the power of the census away from you, then you know that it's important. And this is a direct, um, this is a, a direct uh, contact um, uh, attack on the Constitution because the Constitution mandates that every, every single person living in this country 
um, and has the right to be counted, historically undercounted in the vote anyway, uh, in the, not in the vote, in the census anyway. And what's so important about the census is being counted then is what lets um, the federal government know how, how much, how many funds to give you to allocate for public, you know, for public schools, for, for hospitals. Um, Your Wi-Fi is wiggy. I, I sense a lot of, a lot of amazing discrimination, but not worries. In terms uh -huh. of how you're right. represented in Congress. So it is so very important. And the fact that there, there has been this sort of direct attack on it today by um, this administration shows you how um, uh, fearful they are of making sure that everybody is counted. Because if everybody's counted, then they have to allocate the funds, the funds properly. So that's right. all you need to know. Yes. The, the, the only thing you need about to know about the census today is tell every single person person you know, especially if they are black and brown. You must fill out your census form. It is so important. And people right now are trying to take that, that power away. Power away. So fill it out. It is so important. And tell every single person you know. Um, this is how you are counted. Yeah, how everybody's counted. <laughs> are you there? Yeah, yeah. we're there. We you, heard, we, you, we heard Wi 90% of it. Seth was really good at oh, filling no, in the words. It was like Mad Libs, yeah. but he filled it out correctly. Your Wi-Fi was horrific, but we still got it. Audra, we love you. Thank love you. you. Go home and count your Tony Awards. 2020census.gov. Bye, girl. <laughs> Cafetorium forever. So 2020census.gov. And now I see Dan Pukatinsky. Dan, he's, aren't you in a he's house? He's fanning with, himself. Don't you have air conditioning in your house or central <laughs> air? Or are you trying out for Cat on a Hudson Roof? <laughs> okay, so let me first of all welcome the man who brought us all together tonight. That's right. We texted him. He did everything for us. The great Dan Pukatinsky. Hey. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Dan. I was Dan, fanning everyone, so I was fanning myself. It's all good. Dan's one of the mucky mucks that come back. What'd you say, dear? Plus, I'm seeing Audrey McDonald. You know. Oh, I know. I know. Well, at first, I thought that's why Dan was fanning himself. No, he was just so hot here. <laughs> um, so we've got everybody here from the comeback. Well, we have many, many people. So um, one of the mucky mouth. What, what do I call you? Producer? Executive producer of the comeback? What are you? No, I was one of the, one of the executive producers, and uh, and I uh, played Billy on the show. And, yeah, uh, it's a very violent, a lot of violent streaks. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, speaking of violent, we have Pauly G here. Lance, Lance, Barber. Lance Barber. Lance Barber. His forehead. There he is. Hi, Lance. Hi, Lance. And Hi, Dan. Course, Hi, guys. Nice to see you again. Hi, Lance. Second time he's been here. He's here for young Sheldon. Then we have right. um Marky Mark, of course, the sweet husband, so supportive for a time being. Hi, Damien. Hi. Hi, Damien. Hi, Damien. Nice to see you. Then nice we have Jane. You. Jane. Jane. <laughs> here she is, Miss Laura Silverman. Hi. Hi. Hi, Laura. Hi, Hi Laura. Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi. 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 We have the co-creator himself. He's got three names. Mr. Michael Patrick Hello. King. Hello. 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 One for each name. <laughs> Michael's, Michael's Wi-Fi is just a little... little bit better than Audra's, but we're going to yeah. hope for the best. <laughs> I'll kill myself if it's not better than Audra's. I'll just tell you right now. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> and um, finally, a young up and comer with the best Wi Fi of all of us, <laughs> Ms. Lisa Kudrow. Hey. Hi, everybody. Yay. Hi, Lisa. I'm yeah. Hi, Lisa. Oh, my God. Everyone is freaking out. The, the amount of comments, I'm so distracted by all the comments. Everyone's obsessed. Um, okay, guys, we love the show so much. We're. I basically feel like I'm Chris Farley on Saturday Night Live, you know, where he talks to Paul McCartney and he's like, remember the Beatles? Remember the Beatles? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And then he has nothing else to say. I just feel like I'm having an anxiety attack. Well, so I'll, James, I'll, why don't you go first? I'll pick over here. I'll ask the most basic of questions. Lisa and Michael, you co-created the show, right? You created it together at the comeback? Yep. Yes. How did you come up with the idea? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, was, it was right after I finished Sex in the City and Lisa finished Friends. And right. our agent, you were on Friends, right, Lisa? That was the show? Yes, that was okay. the show, yeah. 
And uh, uh, our agent said, why don't you two have a lunch? And we decided we loved each other because we knew each other in another lifetime. We would see each other at award shows, but never really talked. So we had a lunch. And the first thing that sort of we said is we're not doing a TV show. <laughs> and then and then Lisa, I said, but if we were, what would it be? And Lisa said she had an, a character that she liked. Yeah. Lisa? Yeah. I said, well, I mean, there's one thing I would do. And, you know, I, yeah. This actress who's kind of phony and, you know, with reality TV and everything, you know, she's so desperate to be in the spotlight because she used to be on like a not great soap, but not not great sitcom. And, uh, you know, if she's so desperate, she'll be on a show. And I think, did I say and come I, back? I it's so bad. It's so desperate. It's so humiliating that she's like, she'll be on a show called The Comeback. Yeah. Right. And I said to Lisa, we'll do her a little bit. And Lisa just did this lame uh, actress saying, uh, can't think of a killer. We got to get the word out there. And I started laughing so hard at the idea of someone thinking she was alerting people to the, the dangers of cancer from her own self-involvedness. <laughs> and, we, and we started realizing that if we were going to do a show about an actress, it would have to be about something more. And then it became about what is television and acting right now. And it became about the war with reality TV. And us having come from sitcoms, we began to think about the dynamic of reality TV in a war with traditional sitcoms. And that's where Pauly G's anger came from. And but literally within an hour and a half, we were we had an enormous amount of clarity of something we thought we wanted to do together, right? Yeah, that was crazy. And then when we wrote it, it was pretty fast, wasn't it? Yeah, it was pretty fast. And we wrote every word. And here's something people don't know, and I always like to say it when I have a chance. Lisa wrote every single word with me. It wasn't like Lisa was the name was tapped on the thing and she was the actress. She was the writer as well. And uh, every single syllable, thought, word that she said as Valerie was written down. None of the show was improvised. None of it. But before we wrote, before you guys wrote it, uh, th there was a beautiful pitch that you guys put together, and the whole idea of this show being the sort of the 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 raw footage, the raw reality footage of of reality crew was so innovative. Like the act of trying to pitch this idea, yeah, it, it, like was so hard to communicate. Like you had to write it, and we had to shoot it. Remember, it's right. Yeah, it's true, HBO. They were like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, but write it. <laughs> and, then after, and then after it was written on the page, there's no jokes. Right. Valerie's not a clown. Right. She's a real being. It does. And so somebody, after, somebody actually said to me, is it going to be funny? And the minute Lisa opened her mouth, people started screaming. But the reality was it was a character that no one had ever seen before, which was yeah. Because of Lisa's skill, she wasn't indicating that it was a comedy or a drama. She was just this being. Right. And I think that's why people both became attracted to it and rejected it. Yeah. They didn't know what it was. It's sort of like, you know, our fav one of our favorite sketches of all time is the Mama's Family sketches, the family from the Carol Burnett show. Yeah. That's what that's why it was for me so uncomfortable watching the comeback the first season. I had to he was like I was like this. It was only in the second the second go around that I could breathe a little bit. But it was a lot like you remember Carol Burnett going in the gong show and always wanted to be in show business. It was like if you probably read it it would look like a real, it's a drama, but then yeah. it was Carol Burnett's delivery that was so hilarious. But it was also so much pathos. You yeah. feel so bad for her and you feel so bad for Valerie because she right. is so needy. Well, yeah. we actually, there was actually a moment in the first season in episode six when they went to Palm Springs where people got it. It's when she is with Mark in the car and she tells the guy in the back seat, the navigator guy, if you don't shut up, I'll pull you pull over and put you out on the side of the road. And she she turns, let's music, Mark have music. And everybody went, oh, she's strong. We always thought she was the Terminator, right, Lisa? We never thought I mean, she was. Yeah, I mean, I just, she was, I'll do whatever. I don't care. Pie in the face, you wipe it off and you keep going. I mean, to me, that's just sort of how it is. If you want to, you know, in, you know, I, I don't know, endure or succeed in anything. You just, like, you just keep going. You can't take yourself... Well, she does take herself seriously, but not <laughs> when it, if it's going to get in her way. 
I mean, the poster, the poster for the first season, Lisa and I came up with, and it's Valerie in an evening gown standing in a meat grinder, grinding herself up to be in the spotlight. And that was the feeling that, that and that's also the cautionary tale of what that shows about for me, which is somebody grinding themselves up just to be in the spotlight that doesn't yeah. care about that. It's really kind of a horror movie too for me. It is, it's devastating. But Lisa, I know it, it's based on that Groundlings character, your your favorite actress on a TV show, right? Talk show. On a talk show. So what, like, what would she, what would she ask her audience? Because I think when you were on my radio show, you gave me an example of something she would she would say to the audience. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, she was a, a guest on a talk show, and and she hadn't been there in a while. So, um, but she she was just sort of that self important, and she'd say, yeah, you know, it's um, I just gotta want to get it out there. People, please, please, please save the planet as a favor to me. I will love you for it. Yeah. <laughs> That was one of the things. You know, you're laughing, but at the Groundlings, you would have been the only one. <laughs> a lot of stuff I did didn't get big laughs, but I obviously didn't care. <laughs> Seriously, it's so rooted in reality. All right, well, I want to talk about more people in the cast. So first of all, Damien, first of all, I just want to also say the the – the point of the show was so brilliant is that really no one seems like they're acting. It's so, it reminds yeah. me of also in the British office. It is so real and like you're watching people and there's, there's, there's nothing layered. I mean, it's really incredible how bare it's stripped. So I guess first Michael Patrick King, Lisa, how did you find people that are such amazing actors that don't look like actors on any level? Well, that's Michael the key. Damien. Right, yeah. work for them. I mean, yeah. The reality is that was the key to find people that looked like they were real people who wandered in front of reality cameras. I mean, from Damien, who we knew that it was very important that Valerie have a love interest. That was something we decided very early. Our first instinct was that she was she was alone, and then we realized no, somebody has to love her. Yeah, and we needed a man who looked like a businessman. Yeah. She was going to be sort of a trophy wife, and so we were thinking of an older Mark. But then it was way more exciting and sort of comforting that she's with a guy who's roughly her age and good looking and reasonable and together. Yeah. They love each and, other. Yeah. Yeah. They love each other. Sorry, I think. And, and then Laura. Laura nobody's like Laura. Nobody's like Laura. Laura feels like oh. the most non-actor actor in the entire world. So for us to have Laura be Jane was just like, oh, it's the crew girl wandered in. I mean, it was heaven. But I and had then, Laura in mind. When we were writing Jane, yeah. I was doing Laura. Yeah. <laughs> I do Laura's voice as best I could for Jane. And, That's and, amazing to me. Yeah. No, I have no idea. Yeah, no, because I, I remembered you from Dr. Cat. Right, right. Yeah, we did that together. Yeah, but I was a fan of it before I got to do it. And I was in awe of you and your voice. And uh -huh. I just thought, that's okay. That's Jane. Everyone had to feel like the uh, archetype that they were, which was a real person. And then with Lance, he was so dangerous and authentic to uh, a lot of the showrunners that I was in writing rooms with. It was... It was frightening because Lance is the opposite of Pauly G. I know somebody who watched the first season who said they used to wake up in cold sweat thinking Pauly G was in their bedroom. Wow. <laughs> oh, God. Hmm. Congratulations, Lance. Thank you. Yeah. That's, uh, I know. That was that those are the compliments I get on, on uh, how terrifying uh, people find me in public based on the character. That's and now you're the sweetest man in the world on TV as well. So there you go. That's Very right. Much. But Lance, after season one, was it like people saw you as villainous, right? Absolutely. It was hard to break out of that immediately after season one. I guess I was convincing enough that it was hard to get away from a, um, as a creepy asshole character of different sorts, you know. I'm so you sorry. Had to play dad. You had to eventually. What's that? Yeah. Which now dad. I'm showing some range and something very different. But it was a joyful ride regardless. It opened up all kinds of doors for me, that's for sure. Uh, it got so much attention, especially inside uh our business that it was, 
and it was life changing for me to be a part of. That's for sure. Oh, good. Then I don't feel bad anymore. As not at all. Not at all. It was amazing. <laughs> but, well, we and to be, be remembered for something uh, like this is a uh, uh, dream come true for sure. Aw. Let me. I'm a just, fan of the, fan of the show and the style for sure. Uh, it's so brilliant. Well, first of all, my first question is: Were you guys like in the original West Side Story? Like Jerome Robbins wouldn't let the sharks and the jets speak off stage. Like Lance, were you able to be friendly to Lisa when you weren't filming? Did you try to keep it real and sort yeah, of? Yeah, I think everybody it? was friendly. I think, uh, but there was. I mean, there was a dynamic that was kept just intrinsically just being there. I feel like there was maybe some, maybe some distance, although I don't think purposeful. But. Uh, um, I'm very aloof. I'm cold and withholding. <laughs> so. So Lance and I were buds during filming, so I always thought For it sure. was so funny that he was like this nasty character because he's such a sweetheart. He'd be listening to Joni Mitchell in his trailer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I love Joni Mitchell. Damien, I love how supportive you are of Lisa. It's such a sweet relationship. I have this clip where she's practicing her comedic line and you really are genuinely laughing day at work i don't want to see that <laughs> that's funny yeah 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 the way you do it it's funny oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> it's so sweet i'm and giving so just weird. enough support to get out of the kitchen yeah, <laughs> you were like the epitome of not in show business. Like I, you could go do, you know, you were the opposite of her in that way, which was what made us love him. He, she was like, oh, we all. I thought that everybody would think Val was okay because she has a because of Mark, because she has a house and a career and a man who loves her. And like, yeah. I was surprised people were as like, oh, poor Valerie. I'm like, she, she, she's got it okay. going. On. She owes she got money back and she has Mark. So we're getting so many, hold on, we're getting so many donations. Oh my God, wait. Yay. Should I send this to Dan right now? Yes. Okay, hold on. We just got, normally we don't get so many donations so quickly, but we have a ton. Dan, I'm sending you right now. This is all charity for Dan? Is that what yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> this, this all goes Dan, to me. Yeah. <clears throat> This all goes to the Actors Fund. Thank you, guys. Oh, my gosh. Right? That's crazy. I know. Why is it a secret? Yeah. I know, right? Tell us. Are you sending this to me so I read it out? Because it's, yes, it's, like it's like a telethon. Are you serious? But wait, are you? But there's no total. It's just names of people. Well, here's, here's how it works. People donate right to the Actors Fund. They go to starsinthehouse.com, and then they get a receipt from the Actors Fund, and then to encourage people to donate they get yeah. it read by stars oh. such as yourself okay and so then like, uh, so it's like this? the jerry lewis telethon okay well devin from california 51 dollars. john from washington 25 dollars. sending this in as proof baby girl jay from california 25 dollars. kevin from virginia 25 dollars. <laughs> love the comeback aaron from boston 100 dollars. this is my fourth donation since march thank you thank you thank you thank you andy and rob from california 25 dollars. well hello 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 the comeback is one of our favorite shows of all time charles from new york city 25 dollars. i'm a 12 year old giant fan of the comeback and i would be so thrilled if lisa could read my name out loud oh lisa say charles from new york city Charles from New York City, thank you. She just read your name out loud. Mike from Indiana, $257 to come back. It's amazing. Y'all make me smile. Jeff from Florida, $103 in memory of Robert Michael Morris. Oh, wow. who played Mickey. Nick and Eddie from Brooklyn, $51 in memory of New York City's icon, Gary Lachinsky, who was a huge fan of the comeback. Um, uh, thank you for telling me how to do so that. fans out there. Well, Yay. let's talk about Robert Michael Morris because yet again, uh, it's such perfect casting. It's it's just it's unbelievable. Who who found him? It was my college theater teacher. Oh my gosh! Oh right. He was, was my college theater teacher who had retired and was cleaning oxygen tanks in his brother's oxygen tank business. And I said to Lisa, "We need somebody who looks like they would be a star on a reality show versus an actor." And I wrote Mickey telling Lisa about him with him in mind. And then I called him up where he was living at his brother's. And I said, I have good news. We've written and bad news. We've written a part for you. The bad news is you have to get it. So he had to come to Hollywood and audition at HBO with some other heavy hitters, I might add. Yeah. And he walked in, he walked in and he gave Lisa 
a diamond chip necklace that he had bought for her on QVC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good arm. And she put it around her neck. Second season. And, um, and she said, I'll never take it off. And, oh. he, and he was just a uh, real, he was the thing. He was the real thing. It's like everybody we auditioned was was like, in a way, Michael had, Michael Patrick King had this idea of Robert Michael Morris. And like people were supposed to come in and try to replicate. It never happens that the real guy gets the part. It's so, yeah. it was just kismet. It was it was no, so authentic. It was great. With the casting, they were great. It was great. Yeah. Who came up with the amazing? Here. I'm sorry. Who came up with the amazing? Where, as you're saying hello to Mickey, he's doing his comedic ding dong. Avon's calling, and it's the awkward. <laughs> I'm so obsessed with that. Who wrote that? Oh, Michael Patrick King waved waved his oh, hand. Well, then I did. <laughs> <laughs> For our serious XM listeners, Michael Patrick King's Wi-Fi went out right as Seth was asking the question. He'll come back. And he actually waved his hand up, and then Lisa took the credit. I'll show the clip. <laughs> it's so brilliant. Here we go. I just yeah, love I like, the awkwardness. Like awkward, so yeah. Mickey's here. I'm going to get the door. Ding well, dong, Avon Mickey, calling. What? I'm Ding sorry. dong, Avon calling. Oh. <laughs> 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 Yikes. So funny, really awkward. Um so Laura Silverman, there's there's so everything you say is so small and it's like I guess I'm so curious about like were you directed or is that just your tendency to just be very small and blank about everything? I think Michael's back. Um, I mean I definitely was directed. Michael Michael directs it, Michael sees and hears every single thing that happens. So like if a if part of one of my eyes you know, cross the camera and a piece of hair. He, he, we would have a conversation about what is Jane's eye saying right at that moment. <laughs> so I think, you know, I mean, obviously like it wasn't, you know, I was kind of following my instincts based on what I thought uh, was wanted. Yeah. It usually matched up, but it always was talked about. It never was, it wasn't just, you know, nothing was improvised. Everything was, Every bit of the frame that you see is being controlled by Michael. But you know, it's hard to find actors who understood. Laura came in and just did what her instincts told her to do, and it was perfect. And it's hard for at at the time anyway. It was hard for actors not to act or not to perform. I remember when I auditioned, I, the person that auditioned before me came out wearing a like a business suit and I was like, oh shit. Cause I was wearing like a tank top and cords and like flip flops. <laughs> That's so much how it worked out. Yeah. Cause you're like a real crew person. I, I <laughs> found this little montage of you online, which is so brilliant because I was talking to James about it. It's like, cause you don't have that many lines it's living Norman Desmond style. Like so much of your acting is just in your eyes. It's so brilliant. And the last shot is that devastating moment where, where Valerie talks about um, what happened in high school, how she was kept off the team because oh. of was scoliosis. Oh, yeah. And the, you're devastated. It's so brilliant. It's this little montage. I'm just, I love your acting. Uh, I need a minute. Wait, wait please. You got your time. Yes, yes I did. And Mickey is almost dead out there in the hallway. Thank you. Thank you. Now listen, everybody. I have never, never not shown up for work ever in my. I'm fine. <laughs> what this is. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then in the in the finale of the first season, when Lisa and um, Mark are in the in the study. Lisa, uh, Valerie starts calling uh, Jane Spider Eyes. Spider Eyes. Oh, oh, spider Eyes. eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know how Charlotte's Web was drawn? The spider with these gorgeous eyes that go like Laura's. So they're just so pretty. It's the first thing I thought of was just, he has these, like, and I'll just be mad about it. So talk about what was, you know, it's so brilliant you got that second season. What what was the, if you had gotten the second season right away? What what were you thinking that second season was going to be? Um, 
Uh, well, I think when we were sure it was getting picked up. <laughs> we were sure. We, because we thought it was, you know, exactly what we wanted it to be. And uh, we were quite stunned when it wasn't. But the idea being, I think that the, the biggest thought I can give you is, do you remember Gigi, who was the female writer who was still yes. kicked around by Polly G and the boys? We, we had decided that Gigi, as in Hollywood, might get moved by the actress to the showrunner state. Oh. And as she got bigger and bigger, she got her jaws wired short, shut. And then the, 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 the joke and the horror of the show would be Valerie promoted someone who became an even bigger monster than Polly did. Oh. And he thought, she thought by promoting a woman that she would be like in a softer place. And in reality, it's, you, you would learn that television makes people monsters, sometimes powerful. Because we thought that uh, the reality show would have been a huge hit. There was the double vomit, you know, and people watched it. And so that gave her some power. power. It gave her power and also a different idea of the show and that she would have used that opportunity to kick Polly G to the curb. Wow. And then yeah, I always that. thought like a, a second season would be so interesting because now everybody in Valerie's life is an equal star to Valerie. Yeah. And what is she going to do with that? Everybody now, if the reality show is the hit, not the sitcom, and everybody's and participating. It where's where's the diva juice? Because right. I was a star, I thought that would have been great. And what do you call the look on your face, Damien, in the final episode? Yeah, yeah I thought that was so beautiful. Yeah, it was when they pull back and so telling of where this possibly was going. Yeah, and, and the look on Marky and, Mark's face, seeing all this unfold. Yeah. This is going to be just. Awful. Yeah. And that's what we did follow in the in the second season ten years later. We realized that uh, Mark and Valerie, he's never been with her when she's a success. Right. So he so he won't know how to handle that because she's always just been this amazingly charismatic, kooky wife. And right. then all of a sudden the pressures of having a star, and that's what Damien did that was so brilliant at the end of that last episode, that look on his face of what happened here. Well, that's why they made the Peninsula Hotel for guys like me to go there when their wives <laughs> become legit stars. <laughs> we have to take a, we've got to take our medical break with Dr. John LaPook to talk about COVID-19 and some updates. So everybody from the comeback, take five, as we say in the TV business, and you will all be back. And I've got some amazing clips to show them. So I can't wait to talk to you guys. Okay, you'll all be back. Peace out. See you soon. See you Keep soon. Keep the donations coming. Keep the donations, guys. Bring them in now. So we can start forwarding them. We have all these cell phone numbers to forward people to, to forward the donations to. So starsinthehouse.com, and then you forward the receipt to donations at starsinthehouse.com, all yes. for the Actors Fund. Um, and here is our chief medical correspondent himself from CBS and Stars in the House, Dr. John LaPook. Hey, guys. How are you? Hi, Dr. LaPook. LaPook. I'm going to play um, good cop, bad cop. Which do you want first? I guess I, was on, I want bad over with, bad. Okay, the bad cop. The bad cop is I know everybody is fed up with this. And we we're there's a tendency to think, okay, we're out of the woods. We're almost out of the woods. We're not out of the woods. We're in the forest. We're in the middle of the forest, okay? And we have to do everything. Today the president actually said to wear a face mask. Um, he said it's going to get uh, worse before it gets better probably. Uh, maybe there's starting to be some messaging that is actually consistent with what is actually going on, which is important. Um, the good news is that Oxford uh, vaccine trial, very successful uh, numbers that the antibody response, they had, I think it was 1,077 people in the study, uh, which is a lot of people in a phase one, phase two study. Um, the antibody response was good. Neutralizing antibodies were good. Cellular immunity was good. So mm -hmm. it should work. And now the next step is, will it work? Um, so there's- And when will we know that? They're doing trials in um, South Africa, in Brazil, United States, United Kingdom. You know, the the good news, it's not really good news. The, 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 the way that you find out whether a vaccine works is that the, the illness has to be rampant in order for you to find it out quickly. What happened with no. Zika was they had the vaccine and then the Zika died out and they weren't able to 
figure out whether the vaccine was going to work. But there's so much COVID-19 in the world right now that they're able to take um, to do the test that they need. It's basically to say, do people who get this vaccine do better? Are they less likely to come down with COVID-19 than people who don't get it? So they're going right. to do the control trials. I think you're going to start seeing by the end of this year some results about that. Um, and they're already talking about giving it to first responders maybe a little bit earlier than the beginning of the first of, of next year. I think for the most for most people, you're going to still see it at the beginning of next year. But that brings up another issue, which is about a third of people in one poll and even more in another poll said they're not taking the vaccine. Right. No baseline that there's, you know, a vaccine has an movement. And as long as there have been vaccines, there have been people against vaccines. So right. believe it or not, Benjamin Franklin went to his deathbed went to his grave regretting that he did not give his four-year-old son a vaccine against smallpox and his four-year-old son died of smallpox. Uh -huh. But there has been an increased anti-science, uh, anti-vaccine movement. I won't go into that. Right. Um, it's been for you know more than a decade that it's really ramped up. And now you have something where people feel, you know what, they're, they're rushing this. How do we know it's safe? Um, there is a safety committee that's been looking at this every step of the way. But still, you know, you can understand that people, that some people are going to be hesitant about it. And I think it's a matter of education. So what I said on CBS this morning, this morning, uh, was uh, we're spending billions of dollars on developing the vaccine, make sure it's safe and effective. We have to also develop, have money spent towards communication um, and towards understanding what people's fears are. Minorities uh, are understandably uh, suspicious at times of the medical profession. There's the Tuskegee experiment, which you could read about where basically uh, people of color were experimented on. And there have been other incidents like that that have led to distrust and mistrust of uh, the medical profession. So I think we have to address that. And it's not just going to be from government leaders or from healthcare workers. I think we got to go down to community, communities, um, faith-based centers, uh, community centers, and really have like I did a story about uh, this guy, a fantastic reverend from uh, Minneapolis, and um, he just got up there in his in his Zoom pulpit and said, "Hey, everybody, wear a mask." And when I spoke to one of his congregants' uh, family, actually, they said, "Hey, who, we're, that's our pastor. We're going to believe our pastor." Yeah. I think we got to do more stuff like yeah. that. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. LaPook. Good as bad news yeah. as usual, but that's okay. Always said with a smile. That's right. All well, right, Dr. LaPook. Well, yeah. don't forget that when, when people out there, when you tell somebody, when, when somebody is, is anti-vax and they have, it's a belief because it's, it's not really science-based if you really go into it and you really go into the science, it's not, it's based on other things. And, but a belief is a belief. And anybody who's under 10 years old, please go like this right now. Right. Um, but remember how you felt when you f found out there was no tooth fairy. There was no Easter bunny. I, I know I'm not saying there isn't one, but if there were, if it turned out, Seth, that there weren't, that there was not a tooth fairy or Easter bunny, imagine how you would feel if that unlikely thing were to have been the case. So basically you're popping somebody's belief and it's, it's right. painful. That's a painful thing. And I think, I think we need as, as, as health professionals to be more empathetic toward when we're, we're in this, in those discussions with people who are vaccine hesitant. We have to really be gentle and empathetic and communicative. That's all I have to say. Okay. Well, you're a nicer person than I am. All right. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Pook. See we'll you next see you time. tomorrow. <laughs> I'm much more cranky. Um, okay. I'd like to bring on the cast of the comeback. And um, yes. Lance, I just sent you. Lance, check your phone. I just sent you a couple donations wow, to read. It. Okay. I've got Dan and Damien and Jane, Jane, time, Jane. <laughs> and Valerie or Mallory and Michael and Polly Jew. Polly Jew. Polly Jew. <laughs> Lance, I, I sent you a couple of donations. We got the subtext. What do we got? Wait, oh, are we ready for Janet yeah. and Chris from New Jersey? $100. Wow. Thanks for your commitment to the Actors Fund. We appreciate it. Matt and Mary from Texas, $25. After a long day at work, we wanted to see this. Very oh. good. Oh, Mark I from California, one hundred dollars. Thank you so much. Wow, oh, that's great. Okay, we've got to discuss after a long day at work. So it's such a brilliantly bad sitcom line. So <laughs> who, like, who came up with it? What was it based? The note to self. So many aspects were amazing. So how did that uh, happen? 
it was an improvement over the first sort of plan, as Michael calls them, that we came up with. Well, the first one was get a room. Get a room. And, and I thought, uh, do that. It's you done. It's a little too bad. And so no I thought, no, no. And then I don't want to see that. It just came out of the two of us figuring out something silly that she would say. And it became her hook. <laughs> Oh my gosh, the amount of times that we say that oh in our house, Everybody you don't has. even know. We're upset. And, and and the relentless practicing, which by the way reminds me of um, my friend Jack Plotnick. We always talk about when you're in a show and you have one line and you practice it so many times, <laughs> the syllables stop meaning anything and it's just like vowels because you practice. So the whole, I don't want to see that practicing, was that based on annoying people you know or is that actually you in real life? Do you relentlessly practice things? What is that based on? No, it's just, you know, the person who is... um. You know, she's not really an artist. She's just, you know, I don't know. She's just trying out different sounds, what sounds kookiest. I don't know. It was unnecessary. It's just like unnecessary overthinking, overworking with no improvement. Yeah. It, it, it also shows. I, I had a roommate once who was on a treadmill who had a one-line audition for ER, and I just kept hearing him say over and over again, get her to the operating room staff like for an hour. And I, that's where it went in my mind. Get the operating room. Yeah, <laughs> what I love about that is it really does show how hard of a worker Valerie is and how much she cares. Yeah. I mean, there's an obsessive comedy quality to an actor, but there's also a thing about Valerie really, I mean, Lisa's saying she's not an artist, but what she is, she's a really good person at that job. And she wants to do her best to the point that she stays up all night um, until she thinks she landed something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm ridiculing her, but to me, it's just she, she's full of just unnecessary effort. And well, yes, yeah, we're among us. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The middle of all that. I don't think Lisa is among us. And that's what I love about Lisa playing Valerie. I, there, there's such a difference between Lisa and Valerie that it's almost like she's eating a, a raw steak. She loves it so much because it's not, you know, Valerie tough and, and Lisa is not like Valerie as an actor at all. Um, but I did say there were some days and Laura, you've seen it, Danny, everybody's seen it. Before we would shoot a scene, you'd see Lisa wandering around with 30 pages of script, just going over those lines, those dashes, those, um, Malapropisms, ah, 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 four of those, because that's how she said it when we improvised it, and I wrote it down. At one point, I thought we'd get like a court stenographer, but they were too expensive. Yeah, we <laughs> wanted to get exactly what Lisa said in the impulse, and then she was. It's an amazing performance because she's able to duplicate it like it's really happening. Yeah, but it's let, me, let me add that the precision of the dialogue, the precision of of, of everyone's dialogue, and, and and Valerie's in particular, it was all also echoed by Michael had had a, had a choreography to the camera people that they became part of the dance of the show. If you watch the show carefully, every time you see a cameraman in the shot, every piece of choreography and blocking was absolutely thought through. Yeah. And I'm was, necessity, though. I'm the camera, necessity. The camera <laughs> because, and I used to uh, run lines. We used, they used to say, do you want to run lines? <laughs> the like, camera. You have to choreograph, it was choreographed, like how we would move, how I would move, or who I would be standing next to at what time. Because because there's it, it had to, because there was no, this is one show that we knew at that time where the main character never left camera. So in order for us to tell other stories, you had to see, like in the in the Upfronts episode, you see Paulie G and Tom come out of the bathroom as Valerie's walking by and they roll their eyes. So you get a little bit more about what everybody's feeling because they can't do it in front of Valerie because she's so alert. That So we had to create messy frames. And I think maybe what a lot of people don't understand about the show, you know, because we so admire um, 1917 or Birdman or these these movies that um, that appear to be one continuous shot. They're, they, of course, have to cut in various places, but um, that's how the comeback was shot. We didn't turn around for another side. We didn't um, we didn't shoot inserts. We shoot we shot a take. 
uh, or a shot eight times and then we'd move on. There was no, um, there was editing later, but in terms of there were no internal cuts. There was only like a large amount of, of choreography for the, the actors, for the, the, the camera people, sound people, um, especially because now they're in it as well. Right. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why the show works so well is, is because of this conceit that it's, it's raw footage. Um, technically, w there was a challenge to achieve that. And, um, and I, for one, as an actor, it was a revelation for me because, um, you know, I'd always felt the sort of dissonance with the theater and with the um, moving pictures. And um, hmm. this was more like, let's do an entire scene. Let's not right. like, okay, we're going to do a master and then we're going to do a two and then some close ups. So um, it was just very relaxing to, to go for a ride rather than feel like I had to make something. Yeah. I, it wasn't. It wasn't relaxing on the other side. We would be Thank standing you. by the monitor, and it only kind of only happened magically once. Lisa was always amazing. The actors were always amazing, but there was only sometimes when the camera came in right at the right time and pulled out that you just go, "That's the one." So we would sit there. They were always flawless. Yeah. But usually, only one that became. That's it. Yeah. I recall being very aware of how important this to the storytelling it was to catch teeny moments and to hit and be able to hit those at the right time. There was a definitely a, a dance, a choreography that had to be hit in, in, in a timing way. Yeah, for sure. I would love to see all the footage that wasn't used. I would love <laughs> to see other takes. Like. I never even thought that there was more than one take. And now like, I'm so excited to know that it exists somewhere to like see different versions of it because I, I, I'm, I'm so crazy obsessed. Let me go back to, by the way, the practicing, I don't want to right, see that because right. I did skip over that. My favorite moment, Lisa, by the way, is the physicality of first, I don't want to see that, which then becomes, I don't want to see that. I'm obsessed with any change. It's so brilliant. Note to self, after a long day at work, I don't want to see that. Note to self, after a long day at work, I don't want to see that. Note to self, after a long day at work, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. Note to self, after a long day at work, I don't want to see that. Don't want to see that. Note to self, after a long day at work, I don't want to see that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Right, oh, I love it so much. Plus, all of the diet food, all the like delivery food in the fridge. So it, yes. it all ends at one o'clock in the morning with cake and the line. It's, it's so so not from a camera on the ceiling that doesn't move. So it's all Lisa. The camera's and not doing anything. It's all Lisa. It's so brilliant. And Dan, did you love that you got to have a breakdown? Because it does happen to so many people. When someone finally becomes big, they drop their agent, they drop their publicist. Like, how did that storyline come up that you were going to be dropped as a publicist because HBO basically takes over? Uh, oh, uh, in the second season? Yeah. Second season. Um, well, yeah. I Thank mean, you. these guys wrote it. I mean, they wrote it. When I was an actor on the show, I was only an actor on the show, and I got to enjoy the, uh, the, the joy of reading a script and a storyline and a character who was so pent up and did so much emotion. It was like an emotional, I mean, it's so funny because Valerie has her shit together so much more than anybody else. Yeah. And her publicist who's trying to make something big happen for himself. Um, I loved that storyline and it came in the script and I, I wasn't a part of the arc of what happened to Billy, but Billy season one was like, a time bomb waiting to go off and he didn't get much help in the nine years you know um, it was really fun to play and emotional and angry and to, to me very believable because yeah. it, I, the people yeah. around the stars are so disposable desperate Billy really is desperate desperate I mean, I mean he was as desperate as lisa's character as everybody was jane needed to get shit but the reality is uh we went to the south by southwest tv festival and they were and it was so it was three years ago there was so much television the people were handing out ice creams with their shows on it and waters with ron livington face on it and i thought oh it's too bad valerie's not around now tv's finally as desperate as her <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's such a great scene and it's so physical. Here, here's Dan having his fit. I'm, I love it so much. I've just seen this coming. You were on the verge of. Sorry, let me just, by the way, say that you're literally in a horrible green suit for a green screen scene. So you're in this, always in a horrible, devastating outfit. <laughs> I was going to point that. You should have seen this coming. You were on the verge of launching. And every time I get close, some bullshit happens and I get shut down. And then they leave. Ava fucking Longoria. Right before she got desperate housewives, she left me. And I was the one who was fucking desperate, not her. Wow. I don't want to be a fucking failure. Are you crying? Is he crying? Philly, listen. Don't cry at work. It's not professional. Leave me alone. I don't care. Oh! <laughs> oh my God. Philly, don't cry. Don't cry. It's more professional. Like, she comes over to console him. Uh, sort of. Oh my God. He just opened a vein. It's like, all right, not, don't do that. Not at work. <laughs> well, everyone was disposable except for Mickey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Talk, talk about that turn in act two because in um, season two, because man, it's so beautiful how she grows as the person and, and, and such one of the most perfect endings of a series. It was just, it was you, at the end of it, besides crying and you're laughing and you're cheering Valerie on and Mark on, it's just, it's just a, per it's so perfect. It's like, oh, of course that's how it would end. Yeah, when did, when did you guys figure out that was going to be the ending? That was in the writer's room. Michael said, wait, we were trying to figure out the end. And Michael went, wait, this might be crazy. It's insane. Yeah. We lose. We move to an objective camera. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it becomes like a, yeah. Valerie becomes a real girl. Yeah. yeah. It's a, she left. That something is bigger than her need to be on television, which is her need to get to Mickey. And then I couldn't imagine how we would ever do a real scene with uh -huh. all that nonsense in the hospital room. Right. And it's sort of like whispered in my ear, like lose it all. She she forgets about it because something's bigger. And Lisa and I looked at each other like this. There's no way around this. This is there's no second. There's no there's no second choice. That was either going to work or not because we shot the rest of the movie like the rest of this TV show like it was a movie. So right. we didn't know if it was going to work, but it was our and that's you know the truth about the whole show. It was all impulse and just our impulses together, all of us together making this thing and. There was really no uh, middle road. And I freaked out very early in the first season. We were in Palm Springs and I just looked at the second or third episode where Valerie's waiting for a car to come at the valet and it doesn't come, it doesn't come. And the cameras are just rolling and rolling and I had like a crisis. And I went, Lisa was walking around. We were in the Parker Palm Springs filming and I found her and her hair was up in a towel on the walking on the street. And I said to her, Lisa, I'm panicked. I just don't know if this is going to be enough. And she looked at me and she said, it's exactly what we wanted it to be. Mm. And I was like, yeah. And, and the whole show was like that. And when it got to the finale of the second episode, the second season, that was a big risk. And uh, oh God, yeah, that was terrifying. It terrifying. Was and the interesting thing is for that, from the minute Valerie leaves the theater, we had scored the entire, Seth, you'll like this, the entire thing was scored like a film. The entire thing, we had a brilliant composer score yeah. the entire thing all the way through. And Lisa came in and, and went, and we realized it was too manipulative and that the comeback had to be not manipulative. So we scored, we, put, we ripped all the score out and then we just did it with, rain and airplane uh, helicopters and traffic yeah, because the minute you told people what to feel for valerie no. it seemed like fake right versus, well, uh, you know sort of reporting not yeah. i have to say even after the the table read i didn't i didn't know that's what was happening um, I don't know what made me so dense, but I remember like, I think after the table read, 
I woke up in the middle of the night and finally realized, oh, what this is going to be. And I, I, I literally said, clever boy, because <laughs> it, it was, um, it's one of those things where you go, I don't know. I don't know what you felt when you thought of it, but it's, it's when you think of something and you go, it all, this is, this is, it can't end any other way. Exactly. And I was so happy with the second season. Um, and, and it was a real conclusion. It was a real metaphysical uh, change. And, um, you know, with laughs. <laughs> and I was just so proud of it. Yeah, it was great. But, you know, the thing I really liked about the second season, it took us a while to crack it. I mean, we had sort of the, you know, having guys shooting a presentation for Andy Cohen thing. We had that and but not the big engine. And then it all, we were going to a meeting. We were going to pitch it right at HBO. And in the lobby, Michael, oh. we just like Polly G wrote an HBO show about his experience working with this actress who's a nightmare. And Michael <laughs> said, and, and this is Michael saying, and I went, oh my God. He said, and Valerie has to, audition and i said no no valerie gets it <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be the show she's doing but he had this and it was oh holly g went to rehab he was right. thrown out and came out of rehab pulled himself together wrote a really dense show for hbo he is finally gonna be his genius will be realized because HBO will let him do that, right? And then, oh. <laughs> and then Valerie yeah. Bush has to be in it. And then he stops yeah. her again. I mean, <laughs> and that, that revelation of the care of a Folly G being, I mean, he becomes Valerie in the end to some degree. Yeah. And I thought that was just unbelievably genius. They, yeah. That, that, that oh. transformation for that character, you see that insecurity, that, that desperation for attention that you've seen so much in Valerie. I mean, one of the, the joys or easy parts of creating uh, an ongoing series is when you have people like this, and then you think, well, we gotta have Laura, we gotta have Lance, we gotta have Danny, and we gotta have uh, you know Damien, because they, and then you just have this game, like how do you make them in the show again, in a new way that isn't the same way? Like, how do you get what you love, but also make it, like, don't just do what you did, find something else, I mean, and but so the idea that real, I, yeah, I felt for Polly. Keep it real. Keep it real. Yeah. Jane won an Oscar. Right. Jane won an Oscar for a documentary, and so yeah, she's my wife. And that, and that was a big risk when we went to Jane's house. That was yeah. another big risk because all of a sudden Jane was a character. She was. We actually had those kids filming her. Yeah. So now we're risking having Jane be a real person, a lesbian who smokes and makes goat butter and has an Oscar. And and, and it was fun and a risk, but. And she it, gets sucked back in. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say, I don't know how well known it is, but, you know, Robert Michael Morris had not been well and then got better. Yeah. And there was something unbelievably healing about having him do the second season of the comeback. It was under the surface, not only how much spirit it, it, I mean, from the first day of shooting when he seemed kind of exhausted and gaunt and then he like, he recharged as we shot the second season. And, but all of it was sort of part of the reality of Mickey. Mm -hmm. And it was unbelievably touching, unbelievably touching that his story became what what Valerie's arrival in that hospital room at the end, it was incredibly powerful. He was sick and I knew he was sick and Lisa knew he was sick. And the reality is HBO let us film him without insurance. Wow. And every, uh, they said, cause I, do you think you can do it? I said, we think you can do it. And every single day on the set was a gift. Yeah. Cause he was, he went, as Danny said, he was frail and then he was like, Unbelievable. He, he, he transformed. I mean, the scene in the bed with a hooker, like in a million years, did we think on day one that that he, it was such a gift. It was such a gift. And I think he, 
He loved every second of it. That man. The, the, the day when I was the, the day when I was draping that sheet around his ass yeah. in the bed. It, I, it, I when I was a freshman in college, I did puck and Midsummer Night's Dream, and I was in a unitard, and he was hand dyeing it because he was the head of the theater department and costumes. Oh, and I said to him, "This this is revenge for puck," and we started <laughs> laughing. But the idea that I had all of that. And then when he died, a lot of the um, headlines said, Robert Michael Morris, television star, dead. Um, and I thought, oh my God, that is the greatest thing in the world for him to look down and see television star, dead. Oh my, to this day, whenever one of us gets a name wrong, we always go, Lou? Literally based on, based on this. Very good. June has got the right idea though. You know, gotta get a publicist. Just got to. You know who's great? Ryan. Who's Ryan? Ryan, you know, that adorable publicist from it. Ryan. Lou? Right. Yeah, I know his name is Lou, but I called him Ryan because he looked a little like Ryan O'Neill. So, well, that was our thing. That was my thing with him. Anyway, he got me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. He looked like Ryan O'Neill. So real. Okay, just a couple more things I want to talk about. So in the second season also, I feel, was this your sort of revenge on people that annoy you when you basically had the whole diatribe about like, don't invite me to the set, don't ask me for my autograph. Is that something that's always annoyed you when you finally got to put into a script? Yeah, it's not finally got to put into a script. It's just, it made sense to do it there because she needed to snap. And so, oh, I know what she can snap over. <laughs> I know, has made me snap like a twig. <laughs> Very condescending. And we would like to invite you to the set, my lady. It's like, no, I'm a grown up. We need you and I'll come, I swear to God. Uh, yeah. you invite me. And and in the Am I Being Heard speech, the crazy um, phrases that mean nothing, like it's at the end of the day, <laughs> make no mistake. I'm obsessed with that. Is that just like, you just need to catch phrases that mean nothing? We were just, yes, I wanted to throw in, because sometimes I would talk to, you know, uh, someone's agent or something, and they would just say like, on the same page at the end of the day, or you know, like all these this jargon that didn't mean anything that they were using. So I just thought it would be funny if she's so flustered that she just says all of them. <laughs> I will show it. I'm so, I love it so much. Do you have a juicy ass? <laughs> all right, you're, you're very lucky you said that to me. Okay, because no, if you had said it to, you know, one of these girls with the body image issues, you know, how are they supposed to go out there and perform after you've destroyed them? You know, make no mistakes. At the end of the day, you know, no more mistakes. And I need to know that I'm being heard. Am I being heard? <laughs> Man. It uh, doesn't mean anything. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. There is no point. Oh, God, it's so brilliant. Mm. So everyone keeps commenting and, you know, begging and begging for a season three. So is can Done. anything, can we get that? <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Done. I mean, can we do anything? Could do an hour movie? Is there any hope that we could see these brilliant characters I mean, again? what would Valerie be doing during COVID-19? Yeah. Well, first of all, she'd be behind the curve. She'd be just <laughs> releasing her song now. <laughs> <laughs> Her guilty dot song would just be happening now. But, yeah. um, no, we did talk about that. We actually had an idea. Oh, yes. Are we allowed to hear well, any of it? We're, we're always talking. We thought she'd probably, you know, we thought she'd probably try to get a table read of an I'm It script. <laughs> without realizing, nice. without reading it, and how dated, racist, homophobic it would be. Because it would be. That's so perfect. The thing that would make it talk perfect for the comeback is that she would be discovering it in front of a camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. A recorded well, Lisa and I always get together. We get together all the time. And it's, and what if this happened? What if this happened? Is this a thing that can happen? 
would this be a thing? Where is the world? What would she be doing? It, it, it's, it's endlessly fascinating to me, the idea of Lisa and Valerie in the world at any point. Yeah. And it's just a matter of finding the thing that makes us feel like, oh, that's worth saying. Or well, I've, I've always, always wanted to see one season, Valerie going to New York to try Broadway. Yes. Because oh my God. Eaten alive, I think. <laughs> six, so weeks, much. six weeks five, in Chicago. Six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, what? Uh, Someone is saying it. Bound in Chicago on Broadway. 100%. <laughs> That's, what said. That's what I said. The 15th, like replacing NeNe Leaks like 15 times or something. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. because she mentions it on Dancing with the Stars. She's like, they're always looking for TV people to come into Broadway. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, All that's right, well. what I said there. And it's never left my head. I still think. Well, I mean, if theater is ever safe to attend. Right. Oh my God. All Sorry. right, before we go. Well, that's what Molly would say. Finally get to Broadway. No one's there. <laughs> <laughs> it's shut down. Like, not there. That Typical. Is so I just wrote some trivia before we go. Um, Lisa, do you remember who Valerie played on Magnum P.I.? No. I do. Dan? What? Tom Selleck's niece. Who? I was, she was the teen hooker. Teen hooker. How about Remington Steele? <laughs> she, no. was Remington, she was Remington Steele's godchild. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And Lance, do you remember when people were trying out for Big Dick Perkins, the name that you put on the list for one of the people auditioning? I don't. No. It was anybody remember? No. <laughs> Val is reading it. She's like, "Who's Boyd? Does she suck? Boy, does she suck?" That's her real name. That's her real name. Cassie's beaver coat. Boyd, does she suck? Uh huh. Nice. Um. Lance, let me just show your final, your your punch scene before we go. And this to me, at least I heard you talking about Amazing Race and about how people were filmed vomiting in Amazing Race, and that's what inspired you. Is that why you wanted this, you guys, for this final scene to have you both growing well, up? When we were doing this, this is the most humiliating thing possible and the most valuable thing that could happen on a reality show. Right. And the fact of the matter is, when we were doing the first season of Comeback, there were no other types of reality shows. There was no real house of wives of anything. It was just people eating bugs in the woods or I'm celebrity, get me out of here. There was no alternate thing. And and all anybody said was, did you see that guy throw up on me, Survivor? Wait, but I don't know if poor Lance, well, he's got to remember. We have to shoot it a million times because everything yeah. had me turn away for vomiting. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. And, and Lisa, every time, Lisa and I wrote it that the vomit comes right out of her mouth. And that's, that's the money shot. And every time Lisa's in that cupcake, every time she has this mouthful of vomit, every time she's about to throw up, her natural survival skills turns her face away from camera. Like she never wanted to do it. And, and we would do it again. And I would say, let's go again and again and again. And finally I went in and she said to me, you're not coming in here again. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm here on behalf of Lisa the Kudrow, the writer. She wants to see your mouth throw up, too. Not Lisa. I said, yeah. the writer was wrong. No, the writer was right. <laughs> then he said, he wanted to talk to me. And then I'm in a cupcake, by the way. She could not wait to get out of that cupcake cake suit, oh. too. And it just kept going on and on and on and on. It was a long I night. It was a long night. my hands? It was a late night. It was a late night. Yeah, so it was a sorry. late night. <laughs> so it worth just, it. So oh. worth it for so it's many an, reasons. It's like such an unfunny scene. Must have quesadilla. Like it's so unfunny. <laughs> wake up, wake <laughs> up. And then the vomiting is so grand. So here it is. This is the moment that makes Valerie famous. Right, Holly. That was good. I like the first one. And why do why do I do all those other takes? Because you like throwing yourself on the ground? You know, could have really hurt. Well, relax. It was a joke. You know what? Been riding your back all the way up your ass? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! It's so tragic. 
tragic. It's so sad. It's just like two people in incredible pain trying to hurt each other and then laughing. <laughs> oh my effects. god. <laughs> um, okay, guys. There's something there's something about the the, the classic verily. Okay, well, just before she slugs me. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, well. Punch. Oh, oh my god, you guys. Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you Dan for organizing this. Yeah, thank thanks Dan. Thanks my Dan. My pleasure. Thanks everybody for getting involved and raising money for the Actors Fund. Can my we god. Shout out to Ed and Jack, such a huge fan. Oh wait, Laura, I sent you. I sent you yeah. a list, Laura. Yes. Go, Laura. Okay, Lori, fifty dollars. Can you give a shout out to my aunt Kathy, who is such a huge fan? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy. And then uh, uh, let's just do um, uh, AJ and Dylan from California, twenty dollars. Well, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Needs to be a little bit bigger. I got it. Well, um, I got it. <laughs> you could do. I mean. Can you smile a little bit more when you do that? <laughs> There's so many catchphrases. I look like a crazy person. Um, so people wanted to know, someone just in France said they can watch it there, but I can't remember the name of the network, but it's not just the HBO. You can watch it in many different places. I can't remember what the person okay, in so France far said. up. I don't yeah, know. but the point is you can watch it anywhere. Watch both seasons. It's such, You can watch it. We've watched it so many times. You can watch it over and over again. The comeback, it's simply brilliant. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm going to play out some music during our closing credits in honor of Valerie Cherish's team. Jeff, thank you for asking. And James, thanks for asking us to do thank it. You guys. Oh, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> 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 Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs>